were coming up with were being tested out in the, in the colonies, in the Americas. Uh, and so then cartography becomes important because maps become a, uh, an accurate description of these new places. And they're not just fantastic drawings anymore with, before you used to have drag, sea dragons, you know. There are actually maps that someone has measured, has been there and they measured, and they're supposed to be accurate. So this is the rise then of cartography, and not only the rise of cartography, but the rise of the values that we put on cartography, where we start believing that they're scientifically neutral, that it's truth, right? What we want to say as critical cartographers is that no maps are neutral. They may be accurate in their depictions of certain of things in relation to each other, but they're always laden with some sort of value, some sort of politics, some sort of power. They're made for a reason. And the maps of the colonies were made so that the colonizers could go there, navigate there, and know the place and control the place. And the same thing happens in Palestine. We see um, maps for the first time start being <coughs> included in Bibles in 1525, the first time. And this happens right after the Reformation, which is an, an, another important event. We have the Scientific Revolution, which starts to question authority. But then the Reformation, which starts to question the authority of the Pope. With the Reformation, you have this movement against Catholicism in Europe. And what it is, it's, it's saying, we don't have to believe the priesthood for what the Bible says. We can read it ourselves. We can decide. We can interpret it. People, everybody, everybody can read it. And so you get this idea then that uh, from some very, not everybody, some very conservative circles start to interpret the Bible as a factual historical document for the first time. Largely, for a long time, the Bible has been understood as a work of literature stories that can help you tell moral stories about your life today and you can modify them accordingly. They weren't understood as stories that actually happened like the parting of the Red Sea. That was, a, that was understood as a story, not as an actual event that happened in history. But with the Reformation, when now you can have so many people interpret it however they, the Bible however they want, some people start interpreting it literally. And the Exodus illustration becomes an important map. It actually becomes the first map in a Bible. Um, what's interesting about it, it becomes important because the reformers, the people against the Catholic Church, thought that they were the Israelites and the Pharaoh was the Pope. And so the Exodus story, they're trying to liberate themselves, became very important. Uh, here is... Um, a map of the Exodus story from the 16th century. This is not a, a biblical map, but it's based on a biblical map. If we zoom in, this is Palestine. This is what will be, you know, will be cut up later as Palestine. The yellow is the Promised Land. But if we zoom in, and here's the Sinai Peninsula, we see here that it has the the wanderings of the Israelites in the desert before then finally crossing into the Promised Land. What's fascinating about this map is that it was produced in an era where maps of the world were being produced as accurate contemporary factual. This is a biblical map of thousands of years ago. It was a map that was included in the very first atlas produced by Abraham Ortelius. Ibrahim Ortelius had the idea to put together a lot of the world's maps into one book because uh, merchants needed to carry them whenever they sailed and also diplomats and traders. And he puts together this atlas, it's called Theater of the World, and, and he sells it to people saying, this is a contemporary atlas. If you buy this atlas, you will know how to get from place to place today. And it has all of the ports that you can sail to and all of the places you should avoid. What was interesting about it, the Palestine map was thousands of years old. It wasn't a map. 
of the contemporary moment. But it's important in that sense in that for Europeans, this is what Palestine was like. They didn't want to know of Palestine as Muslim or you know as Ottoman. They wanted to know it as biblical. So this is how, as biblical from the Bible, yeah? So this is how they depicted it. So having now talked about the relationship between mapping and empire, and we can talk more about that um, if you like, um, it's, I think it's very fascinating. We can move on to the specific moment where Palestine becomes mapped. And it's a moment when empire, whether it's a British empire or the French empire, comes together with science, mapping, and religion. And this is how we get the map of Palestine, and I'll show you here what I have found. <coughs> so, moving forward to the 1800s, the Ottoman Empire is falling, and there's a big question. Once the Ottoman Empire falls, the European powers want to know what's going to happen to all of that territory? Who's going to get it? Yeah? Because whoever gets it, whichever one of the European powers gets it, is probably going to be really strong after they get it. And there was quite a bit of a, a, a common understanding that it was probably going to be Russia that got it. And that was because Russia kept making uh, antagonistic moves against the Ottoman Empire at, the, at around the late 1700s, early 1800s, and throughout all of the 1800s. And the reason was because, that, okay, so Russia's up here. Russia needed, in order to sail yearly, it needed a warm water port. All of its ports up north had ice a lot of the year. They needed something that was always warm water so that their ships could sail. And so they wanted to take this area, which connected the, the area of the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, but the Ottoman Empire controlled it. And they were afraid that they would always have to be at the behest of the Ottoman Empire whether it, the ports were going to be open or not. And Russia didn't want that. They wanted control. So Europeans thought that it was probably going to be Russia that got this territory. And that worried Britain especially, because Britain was the strongest of all of the European powers at the time, uh, and it didn't want to change that. So at the same time, Britain and France are at war. The year is 1798, and Napoleon has come to power, and he wants to beat out Britain. It's the only power standing in his way. But Britain has a really powerful navy, and so he does not want to take Britain's navy. So instead, Napoleon <coughs> points his warships to Egypt. He fights the Egyptians instead of the British. Um, and the reason for it is here. The British at the time, the colonial crown is India. And they're still sailing underneath Africa to get to India. But on emergencies, they take the Suez overland route sure. to get there. It's shorter. But it's not a canal yet. It's overland. So they don't do it a lot. It's just emergencies. Napoleon decides he's going to go there and he's going to cut the canal and he's, France is going to control it and that's going to disturb the monopoly that Britain has in India. And then Britain will fall or at least be less powerful. So Napoleon goes and he takes with him scientists, artists, poets, but largely scientists. And they're going to map the area. They're going to try to figure out the um, archaeology of the area. Um, <laughs> and, and they do. They are eventually defeated at Akka. They try to go up here. And the British get together with the Ottoman Empire and beat the French. And Napoleon has to go home. So they're defeated in Palestine. Hmm? Um, so, there is, so Napoleon is defeated in Palestine. It's like an interesting um, tidbit. But he goes back, but his scientists, going back to Paris, they put together this encyclopedia of everything they found while they were here. They were here for maybe about a year and a half to three years. 
Napoleon kind of abandoned them and later they made their way back to France. So they go back to France and they come up with this encyclopedia. It's called The Description of Egypt. It's a very famous encyclopedia. It's really big. It has many volumes. And they publish it and they sell it to Europeans and to Americans. And, Amer and, and Americans and Europeans are fascinated because they see stuff like this for the, for the first time. Uh, since the Crusades, has a Western power actually been into the Holy Land? Uh, so it's a sign that the Ottoman Empire is falling, but what it also does, it inspires a lot of Westerners to come here. Because if Napoleon can come here and he can do all this, we want to see it too for ourselves, okay? So they have really incredible um, sketches like this, but what Napoleon's scientists also do is they map. Now this is a map, and here are some grid lines. It's about, it's several sheets, about 47 sheets, I believe. Six of those sheets, here's the Sinai Peninsula, here's the Nile, very detailed. And up here's Palestine. And it's the first time Palestine is mapped in a modern way, meaning actually measured with instruments. Yeah. And here's Gaza. The Gaza sheet shows the, the coastal area very detailed. You have the coasts that are important to his maps, but you also have the terrain, the hills. And this is because Napoleon is fighting naval warfare, but also ground warfare. So he means these maps, this kind of map. Again, you make maps when your society calls for them. Yeah? It tells you a lot about the kind of society you're living in. So that's Gaza. This is Jerusalem and Yaffa, and again, the coasts are very detailed. It's actually pretty accurate. They were published in the early 1800s, um, but they also go inland, and it's not very accurate here. To, um, yeah, it's in Arabic. It says Palestine or the Holy Land. I don't know if I can. So does that mean Palestine or the Holy Land? Yes. Or Jerusalem. Or Jerusalem. Land of Jerusalem? So yeah, they actually did include Arabic, but they didn't uh, actually survey Jerusalem, but they wanted to include it anyway because it's a very important biblical site, and the people that were going to buy the encyclopedia were going to want the Holy Land. You can kind of still see the mountains. They look very primitive, yeah? Like, like caterpillars. They weren't surveyed very well. <clears throat> it's accurate on the coast, yeah. And it's not bad over here. But this actually becomes a really accurate map for the time, like 1800s, early 1800s. Not only that, you also have now Something that Hilton Obenzinger calls Holy Land Mania. The West goes crazy. They see these maps of the Holy Land, they see these sketches in the encyclopedia, and they're like, wow, we have to go. And it does increase the amount of Westerners that start coming as uh, biblical researchers or pilgrims and all of that. This man ends up being really important. His name is Edward Robinson. He's an American. He's a, an excellent Hebrew scholar. He knows his Bible very well. He knows Hebrew very well. And there's a big fight in the United States at the time about how the Bible should be interpreted. The liberals say it should be interpreted as, as stories. Not every single thing in the Bible is a fact, is accurate. It's a story. It's an important story but it's not a historical document. Then there's a conservative school. He belongs to the conservative school. They say, no, every single thing in the Bible is a fact. And he goes to Palestine to prove the Bible happened. And he wants to prove it scientifically. 
And what he does is he travels the area and he asks the Arabs living here what the place name of this place is. And he writes it down and he goes with a, with a missionary who knows Arabic, so that's his helper. He writes it down and he hears echoes of Hebrew. So he's like, oh, this must have been the ancient land of whatever. You know. um, and he comes up with a really, uh, really important work where you have the place names of the Bible uh, in modern Palestine, which he got from people who lived there, the Arabs, or to become the Palestinians. Um, and so from his list of place names, now cartographers can come with the Bible in their hand as a field guide and start mapping it. Yeah? I don't know why this one's here. Sorry, you should be here. He has uh, this guy, Edward Robinson. He has a set of memoirs. They're really interesting to read. He actually says, the Bible says, this is the border of the Holy Land, of the Promised Land was Dan to Beersheba. And he actually walks it. And he's like, okay, this is the border of Dan to Beersheba. And it's interesting, too, to see how he treats the Arabs that live there. He treats them as if they were biblical props, actors, in his biblical stories. Because he'll say something like this. And from here, Elijah wandered out into the southern desert and sat under a shrub of retem, just as our Arabs sat down under it every day and night. So everything that people were doing, the Arabs were doing when he was there, they were doing the exact same thing that was happening thousands of years ago. This is their, this is their importance for him. They're not people that he sees as equals, living in equal time. They're, they're, they're just props, they're objects in the story. Once Edward Robinson creates his place name list, cartography becomes much more systematic. And in London, the Palestine Exploration Fund is founded. Uh, between the time Edward Robinson comes to Palestine in the 1830s to when the fund is founded in the 1860s, so like three decades, you have a lot of people coming and they're mapping the Dead Sea or they're mapping Jerusalem. Uh, or the Galilee, but there isn't one organization that is collecting all of that, and the Palestine Exploration Fund wants to be that organization that collects all of that. Not only that, they want to be the ones that map the, all, the entirety of the Holy Land in one map, before you just have like a map of Jerusalem or a map of the Dead Sea. He wants to, the, the Palestine Exploration Fund wants to have an entire map of the entire Holy Land or the Promised Land. And they say that they're a scientific outfit without any of uh, any, any interest or any political interest, right? <laughs> but in their inaugural speech, they say, in London, this is not to Palestinians, not even to Jews. This is to Protestants. In London, this country of Palestine belongs to you and to me. It is essentially ours, you know? We, we mean to walk through Palestine in the length and in the breadth of it because that land has been given to us. It's all about, it's ours, it's ours, you know. We're going to map what is ours, you know. And they try, to, they try to say that they're just scientific, but it's, it's impossible to believe when you hear things like this. They weren't, very, they weren't very sophisticated about hiding their interests either. Not only that, they have a scientific, okay, they're a scientific organization, they're a religious organization, but they're also an imperial organization because the only people that can really help them map is the British War Office, the military. They're the only ones that have the capability of making really good maps. So they ask the British, can you help us with this project? And the way that they sell it to the British military is by... Something like this. The survey would be of great importance as a military map should the Eastern question come forward and Palestine ever be the site of military operations. And the British military is like, yes, 
we need a map because Russia keeps making moves to the Ottoman Empire and might take their territories and we need to defeat them. We need to prevent that from happening. So it was really convenient for the British military to have religion and science as a cover for them to come in here and map the area. So they come and they spend about seven to eight years mapping from the 18, 1870 to 1877. Um, and they come up with this. This is the first time uh, that Palestine starts getting its borders. You can you can recognize it. So. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have the Negev. I can tell you a little bit about where the Negev came from, but this is Dan up here. Western Palestine. And it's Western Palestine. That's an excellent question. Okay. <laughs> That's an excellent. I love. I love you guys. <laughs> okay, here's the story. These biblical explorers came using the Book of Joshua to map Palestine. The Book of Joshua is the book, the sixth book in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. It talks about after the Israelites flee Egypt, how they get the Promised Land, and it's a very difficult book to read because it's it's, it's a very genocidal book. You know, God says, you must kill every man, woman, child, everybody. Don't leave anybody there or I will punish you. You have to kill everybody. It's really hard to read. Uh, it's an important book to know, though, because really conservative Zionists use that book today to say, God told us we need to kill the Canaanites, and the Palestinians to them are the Canaanites. Yeah. So, <clears throat> the book of Joshua, the first half is that genocidal military conquest, yeah? The second half is the very geographic book about the land that God gave the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's very descriptive. It has all of these places. And in that book, the promised land, it also goes east of the River Jordan. So really, technically, according to that book, the promised land is this plus more on the east of the River Jordan. The British mapped only Western Palestine they did have plans to map east of the River Jordan, but the Americans wanted to map also. And so the Americans told the British, can you help us? I mean, can we help you? We want to we wanna be part of this project too. We want to map it too. And the British said, okay, how about you map east of the River Jordan? Um, knowing the Americans back then were not very good at cartography, as, as good as the British were, knowing that the more important sites were west, the important holy sites were west, and if the Americans messed it up, it was fine, at least they had the western part, and in fact the Americans messed it up. They didn't get the eastern part mapped. So it's like East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's a vision. <laughs> It's like by accidents of history why like Palestine ends at the River Jordan. Um, so this is so this is why it's called the map of Western Palestine. And here is Dan up here, and here's Beersheba. Dan. The Negev comes into play later when the British in the 1880s occupied Egypt, and was really well, they're occupying Egypt because Suez Canal is there and they want to protect the Suez Canal by having the Sinai Peninsula be a big buffer. So they just draw an arbitrary line from Gaza to, to Aqaba. Right is the way, just going the, back. If the Americans were to map to the eastern side, they would have called it the Jordan. Palestine. They would have called Palestine. it the, the map of Eastern Palestine, yeah. But all of it would have been Palestine, yeah. <coughs> you had a question? So, so this is how you get the Negev. It was largely because the Sinai Peninsula needed to be a buffer for the Suez Canal for the British. And it was just, that's why it's a straight line. With a little jagged area. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, so from that map, in 1923, when the British take over, they actually say the borders are going to be from Dan to Beersheba. They say this, in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference after World War I, Britain, France, and the United States get together in Paris and they're trying to create a new world so that there could never be another world war again. And they divide up the Ottoman territories because now the Ottoman Empire has fallen. And you see the Prime Minister of Britain, Lloyd George, 
he says the borders of Palestine are from Dan to Beersheba, just like it says in you know these these explorers books. <clears throat> and so then this is how you get it. He invited the Zionists to come to that meeting and determine where the borders were going to be. And there was a big fight between them and the French, who uh, had Syria, you know, Syria and Lebanon from sykes Pico. It kind of followed very much the sykes Pico map. Here you have a massive water basin, Mount Hermon's waters, and the Zionist movement wanted that. But the French were upset, and they were like, no, you're not going to have it. You, we already said it's the way sykes Pico was, you know. Eventually, the Israelis would get it in 1967 with the Golan Heights. I mean, this was in the plans, yeah? Um, so, <laughs> so, I mean, that's an example of how it's not really a religious uh, claim that they're making fully. It's not just about the promised land, it's also about how you're going to create a viable state, and they say, well, we need all that water for our agriculture to have a viable state. This is what they're saying in 1919. But, and uh, a very important note on that is that Lloyd George was a Zionist, a Zionist, a Christian Zionist, in the sense that he really believes that the Jews need to come back to the Holy Land so that the apocalypse can come, that kind of Zionist. <coughs> Um, so from that, I call it I call it the colonial template in that it was a map, it was boundaries created by the colonizer that was then um, fortified or made official in 1923, and this is the template then that Israelis use for their maps, and later Palestinians started to use for their maps, and it's not really something that's questioned anymore, like the history of the borders, like early on in the Palestinian struggle, the borders, were, under Pan-Arabism, the borders were questioned, like, these are arbitrary, the colonizers created these borders, but with Oslo and the acceptance of a state, the borders are accepted without questioning them. Okay, so now, just very, um, just, I just want to end by discussing Palestinian counter-cartography a bit. Um, I was really interested, like I said, when I started this project, in how the Palestinian uh, leadership did not have maps in Oslo. They were signing Israeli maps, and this is something that Edward Said was very upset about. Uh, like, why don't you have any maps, you know? Um, <laughs> But now, Palestinian, the leadership, and a lot of people not involved with the PA, have excellent maps. Now you can't really talk about the conflict without resorting to many maps. So now there's many maps. So I wanted to ask those two questions. One, what did it mean that the Palestinians didn't have maps? How were they thinking of Palestine? It must have been different from how modern sensibilities think about territory. And then also, what is it doing to the way we think about the conflict that we have all of these maps and that the map is so important in the negotiations? Often, it's the only thing that's going to solve it, according to the leadership. Give me the border. It's going to solve Jerusalem. It's going to solve settlement. It's going to solve water. It's not going to solve the refugees. They don't have a map for that. <clears throat> this is a PLO poster, early PLO poster, 1964. And when we say that Palestinians didn't make maps, it's not really true. They didn't, they weren't cartographers, like scientifically measuring, yeah? But they were using the map. And you see the map in many posters and logos. So this is a PLO poster, 1964. Um, and not only does it have the map, but it also has symbols of struggle, yeah? And not only does it have symbols of revolutionary struggle, it has women and it has children. Where So, so much of the struggle back then was a popular struggle. It wasn't, it wasn't about give me the border and it will fix everything. It was about liberation. Where everybody was involved, not just the technocrats, not just the leadership, it was everybody. And you see it too in, in the um, Jephaz logos, 
where there's maps in both, and the top in Fuentes logo, the map is there, but it's also it's in the background. It's not the it's not the most important thing. The most important thing, or what's in the foreground, what's more prominent, is struggle, armed struggle. This is the rise of the Fedeni. And then, of course, with the Popular Front, the map is there, but what's prominent about it is the arrow returning. It's the return. You all know, you know that Arafat used to wear his kafia like that because it was a map of Palestine. Uh -huh. This is, uh, <laughs> I read in one of his biographies that he used to spend one hour every morning making it a map of Palestine. I don't know if that's true, but this is written. It is real. Yeah? It's, it's real? He spent one hour? No, he's busy. He's been drawing for the makeup. This is a cartoon, um, it's obviously Zionist, you have Netanya and Tel Aviv on there, um, showing just what a threat Arafat is, because he has the entire map of Palestine that he wears. He's not a peacemaker, he wants everything, you know? Um, but it's also a really nice illustration to show side by side. Snow. Yeah. <laughs> This is in the 1980s. According to the person who made this map, his name is Khalid Tufakci, he's in Jerusalem. According to him, this was the first time Palestinians made a map of Palestine. Or Palestinian cartographers, let's say, made a map of Palestine. And what's interesting about it is if you read the legend, I zoomed in, here's the legend. It's, first of all, all of Palestine, first of all. Second, it also it ha it's it's very focused on on people in that it's focused on the villages, the villages before Israel, the villages after the abandoned ones, or but also the Jewish areas, which he refers to as settlements. He doesn't call them towns or cities; they're settlements. So it's still they're colonizers, according to this map. <coughs> and this map took him uh, and his team five years to make. They actually went throughout the whole country and surveyed where the villages were. They started in 1983, and they finished it in 1988. And what's interesting about 1988 was that that was also the year that the Palestinian leadership uh, declared independence on a two-state solution. So I asked him, I asked Khalid Tufekci, who, is, who makes maps now for the, for the negotiations, largely on Jerusalem. He's very much a Jerusalem type of cartographer uh, or interested in Jerusalem. I asked him how the maps changed after 1988. And he said, yeah, we only map the West Bank and Gaza now. We don't map all of Palestine. It's much easier. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it, is the, it is a lot easier, you're right. Um, <clears throat> any questions on this? So now when we read about you know the negotiations, it's really just about Gaza and the West Bank. Um, like I mentioned before, that's an actual quote from Abu Mazen. Give me the border, it's going to solve. I told you if you gave me the border, it's going to solve Jerusalem settlements and water. Um, but the refugees don't fit anywhere. So for me, in this project, in, I thought it was just fascinating that the refugees didn't fit anywhere. Because for me, what that means is that because the refugees are not giving up the right of return, they're going to force us, or potentially can force us, to think about Palestine in a different way. <clears throat> but for now, in the negotiations, it's all about land swaps and territory percentages. Mm -hmm. If you read the Palestine papers, the question of percentages, this is really just the negotiations. First of all, what the starting point is. For the Israelis, well for the Palestinians, the starting point is the Green Line, 1967 borders. For the Israelis, the starting point is the facts on the ground, meaning the settlements, mm -hmm. that are growing every day, so you don't really have a line anyway. So they can't agree on that starting point. Uh, but they do agree on territorial swaps. This is from the Negotiations Affairs Department website. They, 
there's this myth about how Arafat <coughs> uh, refused a very generous offer at uh, at Taba, or at Camp David, <coughs> at Taba, and um, there weren't any maps that were made public there. And in fact, before Taba at Camp David, the Palestinians refused. They had really great maps. They refused to exchange maps with the Israelis until the Israelis agreed that they would start at 1967. Bill Clinton was there. He starts yelling at the Palestinians. I told you, I'm the president of the United States. You're going to do what I say, that kind of stuff. Um, but they refused to switch maps, to exchange maps. At Taba, they did have maps, but nothing was really made public. So the myth of Arafat turned down a really generous offer. No one really knew what the offer was. You know, so the Negotiation Affairs Department come, came up with, with this about how Israel wanted to continue um, occupying the area of where the aerial settlement is now and all of Jerusalem, of course. Um, so then they come back with their counter map. Well, if we were to do that to Israel, would it be acceptable? No. no. But then they end, time to talk. Let's keep talking, you know. <laughs> Yeah, but the good thing that there's no problem in Gaza Strip. Or yeah, no one. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same. <laughs> they both agree about Gaza. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Something really interesting too in my research was how refugees make maps. Now this is from Google Earth. Uh, when Google Earth first came out in uh, 2005, 2006. There was uh, something called the Nakba layer. Now, the way Google Earth works is anybody in the world can make little pins on Google Earth and share it with people. And Google has nothing to do with it. You share it. It's just like a a base for your maps. Okay? It doesn't control what you make. But in the Google Earth community, there was this refugee. His name is Damien Darby. He's from Gen uh, he lives in Jenin, uh, and he was very active as a Google Earth uh, person on the community message boards, and he made a Nakba layer. And Google, when it first came out, used to show best of Google Earth community. And because he was so popular in the Google Earth community, his layer got promoted. So when you would download Google Earth, it would give you best of, like some samples of the best of the Google Earth community, and they had the Nakba layer there. And that upset. Zionists, to say the least, because it had these dots all over what is Israel. And as you can see from the difference between this map, which the the PA, uh, this is their parameters, the refugees don't respect that. They're going to map however they want, you know. What's notable about that is that it caused such a huge firestorm online where uh, a lot of bloggers were saying, oh my god, the internet is a new battlefield and the Palestinians are winning. We need to do something about that. And now Israel has been trying to establish a presence on Wikipedia, like uh, asking people to volunteer or even paying people to change Wikipedia pages and to make comments on blogs. Like They're really taking it online. But the refugees kind of had a head, up, head start on that. They started at first. There was a town in in uh, 48 that sued, threatened to sue Google because of the Nakba layer. Um, so the refugee maps are much more of a threat to Zionists than the Palestinian authorities' maps, you know? Because they don't respect, Israel can't control what they're mapping like they can control what goes on in the negotiations. <coughs> Any questions and comments? Mm -hmm.